All right, welcome back or welcome to another edition of The Sales Life. And today, man, it is my, I, dude, I'm geeking out. I'm sales geeking out. I've got the author, best-selling author, uh, Mike Weinberg here, the author of two books or three books, actually. Um, but the ones that we're going to talk about today is New Sales Simplified and also Sales Truth. And I know a lot of times, Mike, we try to get on and let's talk about one book, <clears throat> but brother, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just pick one book. So if you don't mind, I wanted to go back and forth between both books. If that's, that's cool great. You. Yeah. It's also, it's all sales. It's, it's a total treat to be with you, Marsh. So thanks for, thanks for having me and great to join your listeners for this episode. Thank you. Absolutely. And for those listeners, I'm going to, I want to give you a little bit of an insight as far as how you can, I'm going to give uh, some of Mike's secrets away, how you connect with Mike. And the best way to connect with Mike is, is you send him an email. He loves email. So he loves email. And then the best thing to do is in your start to the email, put something like just following up or touching base. Uh, and then here's include, the, here's no, the, let me guess where you're going. Include a link to your online calendar. Is that where you're going? Next? I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, do not do any of that. Otherwise, you'll uh, you'll get ghosted by him. Um, Mike, I want to I want to kick off uh, today's podcast if I could. In uh, in sales truth, man. Um, one thing I was in between customers, so I finished a deal, spending a deal. I work in finance. I, I spun a deal, and I was keeping your book underneath my desk. So in between customers, I would pop out, read a couple of pages, and this was like a Saturday, man. I was reading this book, and I opened it up. And I was just like blown away. I had to close it after I read this because it just resonated so much. You, uh, you wrote, uh, this is from old Papa Weinberg. Your number one goal in sales is to make your customer as successful as possible. As long as your motivation is to help the customer win, you will always win in sales. Mm -hmm. Mike, what is the role of a salesperson? Boy, bingo, right there, right? And you know, it's funny. Marsh, I, I didn't want to go into sales because I didn't know what sales was. I thought it was about putting something over on somebody or, you know, jamming something down their throat or trying to get them to do something. I didn't understand. And right before I went into sales, my dad, and he's given me advice my whole life. Most of it goes in one ear and out the other. This one stuck. And he's like, you listen to me. Sales isn't about you. It's about the customer. Your motivation is to help the customer win. And if you're trying to make them win and make them successful, you'll always be successful. You'll always win. So your job is to solve a problem, meet a need, create a great outcome. And, and, and if that's our motivation and we're walking around trying to find out, you know, hey, if we're fit, if we can help you, great. Man, first of all, people smell that authenticity on you and they appreciate the integrity that comes with it, especially in your business, right? Uh, but, but beyond that, it's, it's a great why. You know, it's really popular today to talk about your why, right? What's your passion? If your why is helping someone get out of a jam, achieve a great result, like have a great experience, who's going to want to resist you? The reason people resist salespeople is because if they're slimy and they're low integrity and they're trying to pull something over on somebody, that's a different story, right? right. But no, man, that, that's, that's what sales is. It's solving someone's problem, meeting someone's need and enjoying doing it and getting paid handsomely for doing it when you're successful. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Absolutely. You know, and, and I say, Mike, too, that, that customers are buying your why, they're not buying your what. If you're what you got into this business, the what is, I want to make a whole bunch of money. Well, you're going to be really disillusioned because number one, people don't understand the, the back end, what it takes to get to that. Because sales is traditionally, it's such a low entry point, especially in the car business. It's the mirror treatment. I mean, I mean, if, if you fog up a mirror, hell, you're hired, come on in and, you know, if, if you can help customers see and discover your why, why do you do what you do? Then you're going to make, it's going to move from a job to a, a, a lifetime career. My bio in LinkedIn is I'm a lifetime salesperson. I love it. And I love that you're proud of it. And I'm proud of it Yeah. because, and here's the truth, 98 plus percent of the people that do what we do for a living are clean and they're high integrity and they really do have someone else's best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing mutually exclusive about selling and serving or selling and helping. They go together if your integrity is right. And one of the things that just because we're recording this right in the middle of you know, COVID, one of the things I keep reminding sales teams and salespeople who are getting lectured by anti-sales idiots telling them, 
well, how dare you call me during a pandemic and the nerve of you trying to sell me? And I'm like, hold on. The, the, the jerks that were saying that today are the same jerks that are anti-sales when we're not in a pandemic, right? They're yeah. trying to shame you for doing your job. I, I'm, I'm calling because I care. I'm calling because I may be able to help you because you're probably stuck in some situation and I could bring you value. I'm not calling to bother you. There's nothing slimy about being sales. So I'm with you. You cut me. I bleed sales. I'm proud to be a salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. You, you wrote in a recent um, blog also, um, and which uh, this totally ties into what you were saying um, is, <laughs> I love this, you know, instead of looking for the kill shot and, and following up, you're actually gaining traction and building relationships uh, with someone who is yet to respond. That's good. Speak, speak a little bit about that because so many times salespeople want the kill shot. You want the perfect lead. You want the perfect up. You want right. the perfect customer. I can't get them on the phone. So, and, and you talk a lot about that in your book as far as, you know, did you call the customer that one customer 80 times or did you call 80 customers one time? Speak a little yeah, bit about really that. That's really good. Yeah. And, and, and I think what happens is there's this fantasy today, right? That you're going to get the perfect lead. You started going down that path, right? If you're on the floor, you're going to get the right up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and if it doesn't work in that first message and you don't get a call back or, you know, your initial dialogue with someone face-to-face -face doesn't lead to what you're hoping for, that it's dead. In my career and in many of the people that I've coached and consulted, the real big clients and the great success comes after a lot of attempts. And we're so worried about either we're too lazy or we're, or we're too worried about be, being perceived as a pest that we stop following up with people. My, my friend, Jeff Shore, just released uh, a new book called Follow Up and Get the Sale. Mm. Most of us quit. We quit, we quit way too soon. And, and in, in my career, what I've learned, because when you get good at prospecting, you drip little value nuggets Ooh. on your prospects and you, you tease them with little appetizers of how you could help them and why they should call you back and why this is the right thing for them. Which is your, what you wrote about today, right? Today, that was yeah. today's post. Yeah, yeah. because, because we don't, you don't got to jam it all in there. And, and the truth is we give up right before someone's about to call us back. And what mm -hmm. happens if when you're good at pursuing someone and you're authentic and your voice tone is, is real and you're not just totally self-focused in your messaging, but you, you articulate the value you bring and the outcomes that are in it for them. You leave somebody five, six good messages. You know what happens? They call you back. Mm -hmm. And you know what the first thing they often say is? man, I am so sorry it took me forever to get back to you. Thanks for pursuing me. And you're like, what the heck? I've been chasing you down and you're apologizing to me yeah. for not calling me back. And that's when you start to realize, oh, they are getting my messages. They are listening to me. So the mentality I, I try to preach is what you just shared is you, you got to believe that a very high percentage of the people you're pursuing, you're actually in a relationship with them. You just don't know it yet. They're getting your message. Sometimes when I leave like the fifth message for someone, I'll be like, Hey, I'm thinking maybe I'm earning a callback on perseverance alone, right? <laughs> or, you know, I'll, I'll say something like, listen, the reason I'm calling you is you look so much like other customers that are raving fans. And I just, I really feel like we can bring you some value. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go away. Give me, give me a shot back. I'm convinced because what happens is they finally call you back. Sometimes I'll say, I, I, I think you're not calling me back because you're enjoying these messages. I'll say that one. <laughs> And then they call back with a chuckle because there's a human yeah, connection yeah, there. It's not a yeah. robo call. Yeah. You know, it's not some long scripted crappy thing that you gave some assistant to read for you. And I've had that from car dealerships, right? Yeah, sure. I, I've gotten the assistance phone call and it's some poorly scripted, not even my salesperson leaving me a message. And I'm like, well, if you want my business, are, are, am I worth you dialing me up yourself? The guy that we'll talk about at some point, the, the number one car sales guy, who I know you're, you're excited to hear about my, oh, yeah. my take with him. You know, he calls me, he texts me. I'm not even in the car market. I'm 11 months into a three-year lease right now. Dude, you were on your way to church one day, right? And Yes, and, yes, yes. Well, let's, talk, let's talk about him now okay, anyway. Go ahead. So let's build you, it up. You, you, go ahead, tee it up because you read it. I'm curious for you what intrigued so, you. And then, I mean, I'm, uh, for your listeners, I'm a car guy. Uh, I, I don't take super expensive vacations. I don't belong to a country club. I, I spend money on cars. I've been through a lot of cars from cheap ones to expensive ones and so I'm in a lot of car dealerships and I love, I love the business. I think it's unique. Mm -hmm. I think it has a bizarre reputation that some of it's not deserved. So I'm, I always love talking uh, uh, and I've got uh, talking to automobiles and dealerships and I've got, I've got several friends who are car dealers now, you know, sales guys at yeah, different places. Yeah. 
So go ahead. You know, the, the car business is su such an urban myth, you know, and uh, it, it's got so many and, and customers come in and you're like, uh, no, I, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I want to put a pin real quick on, uh, on following up before we, we rock yeah, out with, sure. with, with time real quick. You, you said uh, recently, you said every other profession except sales uh, gets rewarded for persistence. The athlete gets rewarded for persistence. Um, weight loss gets rewarded for persistence. But somehow sales, if you're persistent, now all of a sudden you, you have this ongoing narrative of, of it's sleazy. Yeah, it's wrong. It's, that's, it's, it's a lie. It's an urban myth. But yeah. I'll use your, I'll use your line, right? It's listen, I don't know how to say this any nicer and I'm not insulting myself as a salesperson, but people hate when we say sales is a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. It's both. It's not, or it's a quality game. It mm -hmm. is absolutely quality and it is absolutely quantity. And sometimes that quantity comes from relentless pursuit. And I have stories in my own career. I tell the story when I lead workshops from Chet Holmes who wrote The Ultimate Sales Machine, who tells a story of every single week for weeks and weeks and weeks. He called someone at the exact same time and ended up getting the assistant and made a friend with the gatekeeper. That's the only thing you can do with a gatekeeper is make a friend, ask for help, get some guidance. And he, he tells in his story, like, I don't know, it was the eighth or ninth week in a row, he, he, uh, he didn't get the call. And the next day, that, that assistant of the, of the person he was targeting called him back and mm. said, hey, my boss wants to know, are you okay? Why didn't you call us yesterday? Right? And he's wow. like, wow. And it was just more proof. Like you're building relationships with people. You, you can't give up because the opportunity cost of making a phone call is very low, right? And if you're in Ooh, sales, that's good. the opportunity cost is low. You're not getting on an airplane and buying a thousand dollar airline ticket and spending yeah. three days chasing some worthless customers, not qualified. Listen to me, people. One of the big myths in sales today is you need a perfectly qualified prospect. No, you don't. If they're perfectly qualified and their timing is right and they have the money and the need and the authority. What the hell do they need you for? <laughs> you're late. They're already down the path. You're yeah, not going to exactly. be a consultant to them. Yeah. You want someone who's not shopping, right. who's not ready, but you want to start a relationship. You plant a seed. So when they're in position, you're the first person they're going to come to. So stop qualifying so hard and make friends and build relationships and plant seeds and water and fertilize and follow up. I'm telling you, I mean, yes, this guy, we're going to talk about Tom as a friend. And for those of you that are seeing video, I'm, I'm holding up my phone. Um, I get messages from this sales guy all the time. Mm. I bought three cars from him. He does not take my business for granted. So what kind of messages, uh, Mike, does he, does he, so what's his, what, what's kind of just some random messages that he sends? Because they're, I think sometimes all over the place what, from, yeah, Hey, I, I got your Christmas card. Struggle on like what to say. Cause I say, dude, stop treating your customers like a one night stand. Hey, we, yeah. you know, are we, are we, are we doing it tonight or what? And instead treat that thing as a relationship. But I think many times because they're not taught, what kind of messages don't come across salesy yet can resonate? What do you like, what do you like to hear from him? What, what, what resonates? Oh, he, I got a text after he got my Christmas card. He goes, man, your family looks great. You, you not so much, your family, awesome. That was, it. <laughs> that was the whole message. You know, um, I, I got a message from him. It was a Sunday. Uh, without, we'll talk about that. Was, you know, he, he called me up. He goes, I just saw you drive by. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's what roll you? with that. Yeah. I said, I said, so talk about that. Well, um, so, so I'll, I'll just set the stage. Like I never had a Volvo. I'm, I'm not, I'm not even in my mind, a Volvo guy. And all of a sudden they came out with a cool car. Like, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, and I went to this dealership thinking I'm just going to be kicking tires. And, and this guy, Tom comes out who is just kind of funny. And what's he look like? Is he a big guy? Is he a he's handsome? Guy? He's handsome. He works out blonde hair, white teeth. Oh, wow. uh, real, yeah. um, just a uh, model, like all of us in the car business. Yeah. You know, he, he, it's interesting. He's just, I don't know, a nice energetic guy. Um, and, uh, so what was your vibe when you first, was it like, Oh no, here we go. Or was it an immediate, did he give off some sort of vibe energy that you were like, without even hearing, you know, cause you, yeah, it was, well, it, it was, with people? it was confident bordering on cocky, but inquisitive. Um, Ooh, that's interesting. he didn't, he, he knew that uh, he needed to help me. Right. And he, but he wasn't, he wasn't like scared to pursue me. And eventually, you know, within a minute he we're sitting down and he, he asked me some big picture question like, Oh, what are you here for? You know, 
and I, I, and, and he got kind of the vibe. I was a car guy and he, he asked me a couple questions and I told him that I was new to the brand and that I was a consultant and that, um, he started asking me some more questions about what really mattered. And I said, honestly, and this is, this is where I saw his genius. Uh, he was doing discovery without me even really knowing it. Mm. And what he told me later, as I interviewed him for the book was, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I can, because he has a theory that if he shows the person the right car the first time, they're going to buy that car, which I thought was interesting. I'd never heard that. And he is like fanatical about how he has cars pre-positioned on the lot, clean with gas in different colors, in different equipment levels. And he, he's so crazy. That he even leaves, his boss will kill me for saying this because I've become friends with their sales manager, but he intentionally leaves a handful of cars and SUVs on their lot unlocked when they're closed. So knuckleheads like me who go to shop for cars at 10 o'clock yeah, at night can yeah. get in the cars. Absolutely. He's like, what, you know, and nothing ever happens to him, you know, yeah, and, it's, sure. and it's always so funny. But so, so he's asking me questions and we're, and we're talking about what I'm doing. And I said, I, I've got kind of a concern because I consult. So the image of the car matters. It needs to be nice, but not, but not snotty. Mm -hmm. and, and how it appears when I'm pulling up to someone's office or, you know, picking someone up really matters to me. He's like, okay. He goes, and I, we're talking about a certain model and, he goes, just hang, we, this is probably after 15 minutes. He goes, let me get you one. And he disappears and he comes back three minutes later and uh, he pulls up to the, 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 the main double door of the dealership and I walk around to get in the driver's seat. And he looks at me and he rolls up and he goes, no, 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 hop in the passenger seat. I got, I got an idea. And I'm like, okay, this is different. And, and I know that some, some places they don't like you to drive off the lot. They want to switch later. But uh, he put me in the passenger seat and he didn't talk about features. He didn't start talking about the car and technology. He, just, he goes, just enjoy the ride. And he mm. took me about two miles away to a local park where there's a loop, uh, an inner road that loops around the entire park. And he said, get out of the car. I'm just going to drive around. I just want you to look at the car from different Ooh. angles. And I'm like, this is nothing I've ever experienced. Like I bought at this point, probably 23 cars in my life. And I'm standing there, you know, on a summer day on a curb in a park. And this guy, who I don't know, is now driving this drop-dead gorgeous car around me from different angles. And he starts approaching me from different angles. And then he finally pulls up. He goes, all right, your turn. And the moment I got back in the car, he's like, yeah. He goes, I just when you tell me what your, what your concerns were, I just wanted you to see the car from different angles and get a feel for what your clients will see when you pick them up. Ooh. And I'm like, done. Yeah. You know, done. Like, okay, he listened. He cares. He's not... Yeah telling me about, you know, the XM radio features and, you know, cool yeah. seats. He's like, he listened. And then he was so confident. And before he started asking, well, tell me about color combos and how do you want to spec this thing? And, you know, we, we came up with some bizarre combo that the factory wouldn't do with a certain cinnamon colored leather. And so we ended up, we ended up, uh, I took the exact car that he put me in right there, as a matter of fact. Wow. And it was such a cool experience. And I, I honestly negotiated less hard because... I thought the process was so cool mm -hmm. and I, I knew he got me what I wanted and I was like, this is mm -hmm. going to be amazing. So, you know, I didn't know at the time, but he's the number one Volvo sales guy in North America. And like everyone on the factory floor in Sweden at the plant in Gothenburg knows his name. And every year he sets a record for car sales. And okay. I'll, I'll tell you more about what he's done during COVID. It's unbelievable. But so I'm a sales guy, right? And I'm a sales coach. So I was intrigued as I started to get to know him and I'd pop by the dealership and uh, he's just, a, he's a machine. And so when I was writing the book, Sales Truth, I wanted to profile just a handful of the best salespeople I've ever seen. And I don't really do much consulting and coaching in the B to C world. I'm mostly a B to B guy. Like I coach and consult and train salespeople to sell to other businesses. But every once in a while I get bankers or mortgage people or, you know, in the car world. And so I wanted to profile Tom because he's so different and I learned so much from him. So um, I had my theories of what I've learned from him over, over the probably eight years or so we've been in a relationship, but we went out to lunch and he let me ask him some questions and it was so awesome to unpack, uh, who he was and his approach and how he goes the extra mile. And I was blown away. I knew he had a crazy work ethic, like, because he would call me on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, when I would drive by the dealership and it's closed and he was in there prepping for stuff for the, you know, the next week or following up on paperwork from the week before. Mm -hmm. but, um, to hear his insights, dude, it was, it was powerful. And, uh, I just, I mean, he's probably the best 
business to consumer salesperson I've ever met. Um, his story, his story is absolutely amazing. And, and speak to uh, his, because you, you write that he leaves nothing to chance. Nothing. Nothing to chance. And um, also that, you know, it, it's, it's the backstage hours. Backstage, backstage, right. It, it's everything from that cars on the lot. And I don't know how much sway the average salesperson the dealership has, but at his dealership, the cars on the lot have gas and they're clean. That's rare. <laughs> and they're positioned in a way that he can get to what he wants to get to in a minute or two without jockeying nine cars. Yeah. And he doesn't have a giant piece of real estate there. Like he's, he's, it's like a, a, a Jenga puzzle, but he, he's convinced he does his discovery and then he's going to find you the car. And, and he even will think on it overnight. Like he, he told me one story during our lunch uh, about a woman who was a longtime customer of his. He's got, I think I'm special because I bought three cars from him. I follow him on Instagram and, and uh, you know, every day he's got some old couple picking up their seventh Volvo from him. I mean, I'm like a nobody, you know, and they love me because I wrote about them, but he, you know, uh, I, I'm not any fun special. And uh, so we're, we're, um, we're at lunch and I'm asking him uh, about all these techniques and Oh, he, about the woman. That's where I was going. And he's got this woman who he sold several cars to, but her husband was not interested. He was like a Mercedes guy. And Volvo has gone pretty upscale, particularly with their larger sedan and their SUV. And he was just, Tom got like so competitive. He was like, no, I'm selling your husband a car. Like he, we got this, the, our SUV is better than the Mercedes SUV. Like I want him. And so the husband came in and he was kind of, eh, you know, maybe. So, so Tom thought about it for a couple of days. And then he made a plot with uh, the woman, the woman who was his customer. He found the exact perfect large SUV with the best package and the right color for that he thought was just perfect for this, this husband. So he brought the car there to their house on a Sunday morning. I think they might've been even out at church and he locked the car and he left the key in the flower pot on her front porch. Ooh. And he texted her and said, left you a little something in front of your house and the keys in the flower pot. And of course, Monday, the couple drives in and buys that car. You know, they took, they drove it all day Sunday and they brought it back to dealer on Monday and bought it. And, you know, I don't know how much leeway the average salesperson has to pull that kind of thing off, but he just goes the extra mile. He thinks he's competitive. He fights. I'll, let me tell you one story that probably in, uh, indicates his competitive spirit more than anything. Um, my old business partner is a guy named Donnie, good friend of mine, a mentor. We're still great friends. Um, he, he's had several Volvos as well. And he was a customer of Tom's as is everybody that lives in St. Louis. And somehow... Donnie wandered into the competitive Volvo dealer in town. And when they found out that he was a Tom Calkins customer, they like went bananas and gave him the craziest deal ever on some certified car. And he, mm. he, he bought it. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> Tom hadn't heard from Donnie in a long time. And I knew that Tom kept following up Donnie. D Tom had sold cars to Donnie's kids. Like, I mean, this was a relationship. Yeah. And I think Donnie was probably embarrassed. Yeah, sure. And, I'm at lunch and, and Tom said at this lunch interview, I'm going to say, Hey, well, how's your friend Donnie? I haven't seen him in a while. And I looked at Tom and I said, it's really hard for me to tell you this, my friend, but he got a car from another dealer. I got a Volvo from the other guy. And he looked at me and he's like, wow, that hurts. And then what he said next was worth the price of lunch. He said, that's on me. Ooh. I got to do a better job keeping up and keeping in touch. That should never have happened. And I looked at him and I go, Tom, are you kidding? No one keeps in touch better than you. Text, birthday cards, this, that, the other thing. He goes, no, 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 no. it's on me. And it was, it was the unbelievable uh, ownership of both success mm -hmm. and failure mm -hmm. that struck me, Marsh. You know what I'm saying? Like he, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't going to blame the dealership for not sending out enough marketing mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to blame the other dealer for being dirty and dropping their pants, you know, and he wasn't going to blame Donnie for looking for a deal. He was like, that's on me. And you know what that says that to me, that screams a winner. Yeah. I own the outcome yeah. and I'm not making excuses and I'm not blaming other people. I got to do a better job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, you go. No, I, I was, uh, it, so many times like customers will come in and they're, and the, the salesperson who sold them before, will confront the other salesperson who is delivering the vehicle now talking about, man, they didn't ask for me. And they get all pissed off that that customer did not um, 
ask for them or that was their lead or uh, you know, they just sold the same scenario with Tom where they sold their family and they spend so much negative energy pissed off at the customer and the salesman and the manager didn't come to bat for me or whatever other hypotheticals y'all have it out for me when what Tom did is, is he owned it. He just said, you know what, bro, that's on me. I love that. Yeah. And, and, and whether you're an athlete or a salesperson, that's a winning attitude. Yeah. You got you, You're not a victim. Can you think of one highly successful person in your life who sees themselves as a victim and has a negative outlook on life? No, because they don't no. exist. No, no such so, thing. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's, he's, he energizes me. And, and it's, he's, I mean, he's indefatigable. And I, I never say that word right, but it's, I mean, he, you can't. That's, that's a good word. You there. can't defeat him. You can't exhaust him. He, and, you know, he, it's interesting. I, he obviously makes a great living, um, but he's not doing this for the money at this point. He, he, he wants to be number one. And once in a while, just to get him, I'll goose him. I'll send him a text. I'm like, hey, how's that guy in Chicago doing? who's on your heels and then he'll snapshot a picture of the national thing and let me like, you know, he's fine. He, he wants to win. Yeah. And, and, and he, and you, this is something we can't get away with. And I know in the retail car world, you guys work hard and the hours are difficult and you've got the weekend thing, but he's not going to be outworked. Yeah. You know, and there are days when he is juggling a customer with a service problem and a delivery to a new customer. And, you know, deliveries mm -hmm. aren't simple today, right? With all the software and the mm -hmm. syncing and the, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he's got new people in the showroom that he's got on multiple drive. Like I've watched him. Sometimes I'm in there. It's like a circus going on, but he's, he's smooth and, and it's, it's awesome. And I just, let me just say one more thing, because this is just more indication of how hard someone could work and how focused. Cause a lot of salespeople are whining about COVID and I get it. And it's affected my business hugely. Like I usually am on five, six airplanes a month. Yeah. You know, I, I, this has been radically different for me doing everything virtual and adapting what I'm my business. And Southwest is your, is your, it is. Uh, I'm, is a, your I'm a friend of Southwest. Yeah. <laughs> Going overseas, I fly American, but in yeah. the States, I try to do, try to do Southwest. And, um, I was going back and forth with Tom and he sent me a note in, in early June that at the end of May, he set a personal record for most cars he's ever sold in his career in a month. And I want you people to hear me on this. The dealership was effectively closed in May. They were not open to walk in traffic. They were seeing people by appointment only. And he sold like 63 cars in May. Holy cow. Okay. So think about the effort that he went to, to line up meetings, to work his database, to prospect, to ask for referrals, all the proactive things that he does. To, and, and, and be laser focused that when he couldn't even get walk-ins and obviously he's got the best desk and the best spot on the floor, but that wasn't helping him because no one was popping in and he set a record and then he did it again the next month. Hmm. So I'm just, what I'm, what I'm saying is, and particularly in COVID, we're seeing this gap between what top producers and everyone else is producing. Mm -hmm. The best people figure it out. Mm -hmm. They have the right attitude. They're positive. They don't whine. They don't throw pity parties. They're creative they're bold and they're disciplined. They do what they have to do. And, and without talking to, to your audience about messaging technique or discovery technique or closing techniques and objection busting and all that stuff we love to talk about as salespeople, what I'm telling you about Tom and, and everyone else that I see is a superstar, it's not the tricks. It's not the shortcuts. It's the work ethic. It's the mastering the fundamentals. Yeah. Like, are you guys, are you with me? Like, I know you're not. And I get that's, that's who rocks it in sales. When you master the basics, you win. And when you look for shortcuts and the easy button, you struggle like everybody else. So what are some of the fundamentals that, that, are, that are key? Okay, well, let's start philosophically. It's not about you, it's about the customer. And, and let's play that out in the car business. And I'll tell a story of an, uh, a horrendous example I had um, at an Audi dealership where I went in because I, now that I'm an old man and I have a fun sports car that I drive, I want my daily driver to be like cush and quiet. I have enough chaos in my life and I drive like a madman enough in my fun car <laughs> that in the, in the thing I take my road trips in, I want quiet. And I heard how, how quiet the Audi cabin was, like totally reduced road noise, good insulation. And I pop into a sedan on the showroom floor and some young sales guy pops in the car right next to me and sits down in the passenger seat. Doesn't ask me one question why I'm there, what I drive, what I'm looking for. 
he immediately starts going into this like Audi virtual reality, you know, cockpit and this beautiful image and how it's all tied together and the computer generated graphics. And he went on for like five minutes and I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know that I'm here because I'm interested in a quiet car. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so talk about uh, a, a basic sin, no sales call structure. Uh, it's sales malpractice to present before you do discovery. He wasted more energy and more breath on me. And he turned me off. I'll never talk to that guy again. Because mm -hmm. all he cared about was the tech. Someone, some idiot told him when someone sits down in a car, you just start telling about this, this yeah. virtual instrument panel. That's so cool. Well, we I didn't throw really up care. all over him. Yeah. I would have been fine with analog dials if the car was quiet yeah. and it drove the way I wanted it to drive, you know? So, so um, bad sales call structure, not having good probing questions um, or just asking surface questions. Like sometimes, sometimes we'll ask, well, tell me, tell me what your frustrations are with your existing vehicle or what are you trying to avoid? What you call picking the scab, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're just trying to understand where do you have some pain or what are you trying to get done? And what sometimes happens is we get the first surface answer from the prospect. Mm -hmm. They'll say, you know what? I, I don't really like this. This kind of bothers me. So instead of asking the next question, which is, okay, well, why does it bother you? And what have you tried to fix it? you know, to, to uncover even more of their pain and desires. Mm -hmm. We are so quick to get one quick thing that we think we can solve. Yes. And then we stop probing. And then we jump to the presentation phase of the meeting. And we say, oh, well, you have that problem. Let me show you how I can help you. We have this feature and we have this feature. And this is going to solve exactly what you need. Let's get you in this car. And I'm like, slow down. Our, here's, here's what happens in my mind. Our instinct as salespeople is we smell blood in the water, right? We, we know this is a real, a real prospect. We could taste the commission check. Mm. So we prematurely cut off our probing and we start presenting. And my coaching to salespeople is, oh, no, 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 no. When you're in the probing and discovery phase, stay there. When you uncover a problem or an, an, a, a, a desire, ask, hey, when someone says to you, I've always dreamed of having this color combination, right? I just always, I see this and I love it. My, my answer is not, oh, we have that. My answer is, okay, tell me why that's so interesting. What is it about how those colors work together? And what, what other cars have you seen that on? And have you ever had that experience before? And that's great. And, it, you know, and how likely if we could put that together or you don't, you don't want to do something. And, and who else cares about this in your house that, that needs to see these samples? Yeah. Like, think about the professional you come across as if you ask those questions. Plus, mm -hmm. you're learning so much more. And I don't know the car business. So if I'm, if I'm saying stupid stuff here, correct no, me. No, 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 no. You're like, right on. Because we're so quick to want to pitch but most good sales is a dialogue. We're not pitching and they're not resisting. We're just talking. We're understanding, we're learning, we're, we're trying to figure things out. Um, that's all. So it's, it's uh, those types of basics. And then follow up. You can't assume that someone's not interested because they, you didn't hear back from them. Oh yeah. Just, and I, this doesn't happen to me very often, but I did a significant proposal last week for a prospect that pretty much led me to believe it was, it was gonna happen. And I sent the proposal on Wednesday and I didn't hear back. So I followed up on Friday and I didn't hear back. And I'm like, that's really weird. Maybe they're having trouble getting funding or whatever. And I sent uh, a text message to my, one of my contacts on Monday and I got a phone call. Right. And I learned a little more. And then he's got another guy on the other side of the country. I got to coordinate with, and I'm realizing it wasn't dead. There's just some hurdles on their side. And instead of me getting frustrated with them, I had to coach myself and go, breathe, Mike, relax. They're not manipulating you. Why don't you keep selling and help them work through these hurdles internally? Like, why don't you do what you teach? Patience. You know, yeah, and you're not going to get every deal. You can't. No. But it's sitting, it's, it's sitting in the tension. It's like a quarterback, you know, a running quarterback who comes into the league and immediately they take off running. Uh, but at the minute they feel pressure, and so as salespeople, how can you learn to sit in the tension, even though you feel the pocket collapsing around you, yet you're still reading the defense and saying, that's the direction I need to go. We're terrified of the you. tension. Take this in the most professional sales brotherly way. I love you. That was <laughs> unbelievable. Are you an LSU guy? Let me guess for you. Are you, are you the happiest? Dude, I'm a bandwagon LSU guy, man. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, you I'm live there. You got to so, be, yeah, right? Yeah. Who, who doesn't love Coach Ed and that team last right. year? I mean, that was as good as it gets. Go Tigers. Yeah, go. <laughs> Had to change my spelling. Um, yeah, that analogy is so good because we're not patient. And, you know, I'll, I'll take the football analogy one more step. You said, you know, they are too quick to, to run. 
because they that's what they know how to do. They don't let the play unfold. It's the mm -hmm. same thing when they go from college to the pros mm -hmm. and they talk about how the game has sped up on them. Like they, it, it's not what college was because everybody's big and strong and fast in the NFL. And then over time, as you become more of a professional, the game around you slows down and you can read the defense and you see, Ooh. right? And that's the same thing in sales. When you're in the middle of the heat that's of good. battle and you're nervous and you don't own your sales call structure and you don't have good questions either written down or memorized, you panic. And, and as, as Mar yeah. said, you either start to run or, or you just, you, you, you call the wrong audible because you don't know what to do. And, and what typically happens when you get comfortable selling is you slow everything down. You're not in a hurry. You, and, so and, and, and in longer sophisticated sales, you know, where you're, someone's selling a massive software deal to a giant company that's going to affect a whole lot of people. Like one of the rules we, we like to apply is that sometimes to speed up the sale, you have to slow down the sales process. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like today, just, just today, I got an email from a guy and the company name sounded familiar, but this, this guy's name was not familiar to me. And he was, he was um, only a salesperson in the company, but he was asking me for like a proposal and pricing to do a full day session. And I'm like, this is just kind of interesting. Like he probably doesn't even have the authority. He's just a sales guy. So I wrote back a nice note. Thank you for inquiry. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously honored. I'd love to learn more about your objectives for initiating contact with me. Hey, I have a question for you. Along with yourself, which other executives at your company care about this meeting and are going to be involved in planning it with me? And, and but that's a nice way of asking, hey, I know you're not the guy. Who, who's the guy, right? Yeah, who's the guy? Exactly, yeah. And, and, and so what, what I could have done is, oh my gosh, I got a hot one on the line. You know, this guy wants me for a day. He, he sure. said nice things about me. He read my book. I should give him a price and tell him what day I can come do his meeting. But that's the immature response. So just because the customer goes, what's your best price? That doesn't mean giving him a price mm. is the right thing to do. Because we don't get paid to obey the customer. We get paid to close deals. Yes. And sometimes we need to slow down the process to speed up the win. And it means, hey, let's, let's, let's back off and talk a little bit. Tell me a little bit more about why you're here. What are you looking for? Why our dealership? What, are you, you know, what type of experience? Because you learn, so then you're in a better position to present. Yeah, because I think the customer comes in, they're bringing a lot of baggage, especially in the car business, man. They're, they're bringing all, it's got really nothing to do with you. It's got everything to do with your profession. So the salespeople are, are that are the customers are coming in with that, with that logic baggage coming in with that thing. And many times what we do is, is we don't like, I love what you said, where you just, Hey, let's back off just a second and figure out exactly, you know, why me, what is it I can do? You know, what do I have that will actually, you know, work for you? What you, you know, one thing that you, that you speak of um, in the book as well, is that you know nowhere is it written that complying to a customer's request or process guarantees us an advantage as a matter of fact it puts you at a disadvantage because you ain't scoring obedience boy you don't set make a sale based on the obedience points and the acquiescence approach man speak to that yeah well let's go back to tom i'm telling you tom tom is making more margin on his car sales than the yeah. average guy you know why because he owns his process and let me tell you something he's setting records for volume yeah. So, so don't tell me that it's only price and only mm -hmm. people care about is price because we have an internet and we have all these sites that give you values and you have like, there are people who are winning who aren't selling on price every day. Yeah. So you don't win the way I love the quote you pulled from the book. You don't win deals by doing exactly what the customer says. You win deals by bringing them value. And your mission is to give the customer the most value and to give yourself the best chance of winning the deal. So anytime the customer, this is, I mean, this is with like deep in my soul. When your customer asks you to do something that doesn't allow you to get them the best solution or doesn't give you the best chance of winning, just call time out and say, hey, I, I know you're asking for this, but I found that's not the best way to approach this. L let me share with you what we have found works best for you. Let's understand, let's talk, share a little bit more with me, and then I'll walk through the process. And we may end up giving you the world's greatest price but I need you to understand what else is involved in this transaction because there's, there's a difference between price and cost also. Right. Ooh. And, and there's experience and there's fun and there's you calling me in the middle of the night when, when you need something and the way we're going to treat you when you come back with a challenge from, you know, 
I'm saying like, there's, there's reasons people pay more. Otherwise yeah. we would all be driving the lowest yes. priced everything. We yeah. would all have the cheapest toilet paper. Yeah. Like, do you want to, to wipe your ass with sandpaper? No. <laughs> like, right. You know, and maybe during when there was no toilet paper in the stores for a month, Month that we we all started wondering what are we going to do Dude, <laughs> as an alternative. The but whole you toilet can't... paper thing though, like where did toilet paper? How did that come into the shits of? <laughs> COVID I did a tweet. Shits? I did a tweet, and I'm like, after like a month, I guess I went to like six stores in a row one weekend. I got nothing, <laughs> nothing. I'm like buying tissues, like I'm buying Kleenex, thinking, yeah. well, if I got to wipe my butt with that. And I, I finally tweeted, Going out, people, Sonic, what's wrong with you? Napkins, yeah. I said, come on, people, it's a respiratory virus. It right. does not give you the shits. It's a respiratory virus. Like, come on. <laughs> like, I don't, I, there's no uh, correlation. Nothing about that made sense. No, it was like no. people thought they could control something in their life. I've got to buy toilet paper. It just shows you how fear sales, though, man. It is, man. I, I, and I love sales. And, you know, I, the, the thing that's beautiful about sales, it's a chance to have fun and financial reward at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And to be judged on results, not work. Yeah. No one asks a top producing salesperson how many hours they worked. And again, a lot of them work really hard, but it's, about, it's a chance to produce and make friends and, and bring value and drive the economy. And, you know, I, I love sales. I am a, a pro sales, period. Well, one thing I love about sales and I tell my, uh, a lot of my sales people too is, you know, sales is not a lot, even if it's not a lifetime profession for you, you can take the skills and the beautiful thing about it is as salespeople, we can handle volatility. So no matter what, if there's a war, if there's a storm, if there, no matter what the situation is, the longer you stay in this profession, you can pivot on a dime that so the mass of people in the world cannot. We have an ability, a unique ability of being able to take the situation, bitch about it for 37 seconds, and then we pivot and try to make the best out of it. It's really good. Really good. Yeah. Hey, can I, can I ask you a question? Sure, man. Because this always intrigues me. Because I'm all about being proactive when we sell. Mm -hmm. And yet I feel like there's a lot of people in the auto industry that they're good when they get a lead. They're good with a walk-in. But when nothing's going on, they're just sitting around. Yes. What, what do the best, and, and a guy that's not Tom, that doesn't have the Rolodex and the referrals and like, you know, his world's, it can't compare him because it's not fair. But for the average, the average guy, what do they do to be proactive when it's slow? What, what should they be doing to initiate contact with prospective buyers or drum up referrals or get, because, because I can't stand when I stand, see people sitting around and playing on the internet. When I walk into a car dealer, I'm like, dude, you're going to starve. Let's go sell something. There's, let's go there's, down let's go canvas the corporate building down there. Let's, let's go give out something. Let's call everyone we ever sold the car to and offer them 50 bucks for a referral to collect. What, what do you do? Like, what do the best guys do? Do. <laughs> they just do. They, they're in action, right? I it's mean, like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the thing. So, you know, some of it, so there are so many customers like in our business, there are so many orphan customers that are sitting right there um, in the waiting room, waiting on their cars to be serviced. One thing that I did when I was on the floor and I teach now is, yes, it's, it's, it gives you the bubble guts in the morning. When you get there, you have no idea who this person is. Yet, if you can learn how to just talk to that customer, what I did is as soon as I got there in the morning, I struck up a conversation with them. They're waiting to get their oil changed anyway already take the psychological L. So I'm not even trying to, I'm not trying to gain anything from them. I get them to open up. I get a chance to actually practice with them to show a, a, a vehicle because they're waiting anyway. And then lo and behold, something turns so into it. Hey, it's, it's beautiful. Or when you call customers, you know, your old customers, you call them not for anything other than just to say hi. And if anything at all, like I tell customers, you know, I, I get, I get uh, emails from Old Navy all the time. They don't get pissed off because I don't answer the email or I don't show up at school, <laughs> right? But what they're doing is they're constantly, like you said, they're dripping something in there. Yeah. And so if you call your customers, your old customers, you're priming the, cu the pump because it's not their job to remember you. It's your job to make sure they never forget you. Oh, that's so good. And so if you call them just to just to prime the pump, just to say hello. They get off the phone, their granddaughter comes to the house bitching about her car and she says, you know what, I was just talking to Marsh. But it, had I not called, they would have been like, there's some big six foot three ball headed guy at the dealership and I don't even remember which, which one he works at. You know, that's what happens. You're just priming the pump. So often we want the kill shot. We want the, you know, the mm. one, 
sales is not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's a 50 to one ratio. But if you put those, I'll buy those seeds from the grocery store and dump them in my hand and tell the salesperson, now you tell me which seeds are going to germinate. You have no idea. Perfect. So you got to throw them out. And whichever ones come up through the soil is not, you just got to cultivate that thing. You got to put it out there in the, into the dirt. Dude, I'll, I'll throw a faith component into what you just shared. And honestly, this helps me sell. Like I, I'm, it's not my job to make that seed sprout. Mm. My job is to plant seeds in water and fertilize. God's going to produce results. Like I, I'm with you. And, and that some of what you're saying too is, is a reminder that prospecting and selling is a game. And people are like, well, can you deal with rejection? I don't even think about it as rejection. You're just trying to find the person who, who you can help right now. It's yeah. just, it just, it's not personal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a numbers game. You're going to work through a lot of no's, a lot of challenges, even some rude people. Just shake it off and move on. Keep planting seeds. Be nice. Ask questions. Laugh it off. When I get attacked by someone in a, uh, you know, and I, and I coach other salespeople, when you get a really rude person, that wants to abuse you because you initiated contact with him. I, I push him back a little. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not sure who upset you in the past or what this, what I walked into is going on in your mind, but, but I never did what you're saying. I'm just calling because I help a lot of people that look like you. And I thought maybe I, that I might be a fit and to get you what would be valuable for you. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, sometimes people will go, Oh, you, you got me. I'm sorry. Right. Like, you know, there's this, this wall. And here's the thing. It's not your fault but it is your problem. That's something yeah. I say in New Sales Simplified. Yeah. It's yeah. not your fault, but it is your problem because other moron salespeople poison the waters mm -hmm. and other low integrity guys and other time wasters pissed off buyers. Mm -hmm. So they have this automatic resistance to salespeople, mm -hmm. which is why you don't want to sound like a salesperson mm -hmm. and be overly cheesy and overly enthusiastic. You just want to be normal. Talk to people like you're normal. So their resistance comes down. But if they, if they resist you, just realize that's not personal. And that's why you got to come back at them again. When I teach prospecting, I'm always reminding people that first no, when you ask them to meet with you, it's automatic. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't mess up. It doesn't mean they no. didn't like you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, that's what I call a knee jerk no. Um, where, you know, the first no, like Anthony Inarano says, the first no is free. The rest of them, dude, you got to earn. Absolutely. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to earn it. And that's, but that's all mindset. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if you think about, we talked about Tom, you think about t top producers, it's mindset. You play to win, but you realize you don't win every game. Yeah. 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 You got time. I know you need to go to, uh, to, I know you, you're lined up, man. I really appreciate you got time for a couple of uh, quick rapid yeah, quick. fire questions. Yeah. I got a couple seconds. Yep. You got all right. It. Cool. Favorite movie. And it could be sales related or not. Oh, I'm going to pass on the favorite movie. I have so many movies I, and I'm, I'm just not even a movie guy. I'm, I'm passing on the movie. All right. Uh, let's see. If you could start over in any sales profession, what would it be? Wow. In, in sales? Yeah. In a sales profession, you get to choose the industry. What would it be? Probably medical devices. Mm. I just see a lot of people making a lot of money in medical devices and they like what they do a lot. And here's what I'm going to do later in my career. I really want to go sell Porsches because it's just always ah. been a passion of mine and I want to learn the car business. So uh, that's in Beautiful. my future. All right. And this leads to my third question, which is right in, if Porsche was not made, what would be your alternative vehicle? Oh my gosh. I love cars. Yeah. Like I, I fell in love with the look of a Porsche 911 when I was 10 years old. So it, it's kind of this thing that's always been the car. And because the Carrera has looked the same for 50 years, mm -hmm. there's just something unique and classic about it. So that's where it has. But beyond that, I love every car. I mean, there's times I see a Toyota Corolla and I just stare at it and I go, you know what? There's some decent design in that car and it, and it serves a purpose. Like, like I'm not a car snob. It's yeah. funny, like I love cars. I have some expensive cars, but I love, I, I'll give you an example. I, was, I went for a walk at our park this morning and I parked my Volvo station wagon <laughs> that Tom <laughs> sold me, my consulting mobile, next to this like probably 1998 BMW M3 convertible. Ooh. I walked around that car for like five minutes. It yeah. was in terrible shape. The guy did, I was ready to make the guy an offer. Like, is this like a $4,000 car I could pick yeah, up for fun? Yeah. But it was so poorly cared for in the inside and so messy. I'm like, there's no way this guy did the maintenance. They can just tell by looking at the car. But I was looking at the lines and I'm like, oh, these were BMWs before they became all luxury cars. You know, this was a driver's car, you know, mm -hmm. from 15 years ago. So now nah, I don't know. I, I love so many cars from yeah. the old Camaro to... Oh, I love the, uh, 
it, everything. I was looking on, online last night at old Honda S two thousands, you know, oh, just yeah. fun, that, different. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have an answer. Sorry for you. I, I, just, I love uh, all cars. That's all good. Yeah. All right. Uh, last one. If you could coach a professional team, what sport would it be? What position would you coach and what player would you want to coach or be most involved with? I think I know the answer to the first one. It's such a great question. Um, this is going to sound really weird. I love college basketball. So that seems like it'd be the most fun, but I know nothing about it. So mm -hmm. I would coach baseball because I'm a lifelong baseball fan. I wanted to be a baseball player. Uh, did not make my high school team, tried out in college, went over for the fall during fall baseball. Like <laughs> this was a bad experience. <laughs> so I would want to be the coach of the St. Louis Cardinals. And I'll tell you, the guy who I just love is uh, our pitcher, Adam Wainwright, who's been around 15 years. Um, Superman, super dad, high integrity, man of faith, fun ambassador for the town. Um, and, and so probably him. I would, be, I would be the Cardinals manager or pitching coach and be involved with Adam Wainwright. That's just a classy organization, although they've been like quarantined for the last two weeks, locked yeah, up in a yeah. hotel with COVID. So we're not seeing much baseball here in my town. <laughs> well, Mike, man, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out, man. I I've got so many more questions, so I hope that we can get together at a later time. Yeah, man. we'll revisit. Uh, we'll get together again. I'd love it, man. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, proof positive that you are uh, uh, a great seller. Is that Katie right behind you there? Oh, yeah. She, I said in the first book, that's my dedication. This is... This was our 25th anniversary trip. We went to Italy. Awesome, bro. Right. Uh, last year. Thank God before Corona. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, that's in Venice. And uh, she is the best proof that I can sell. Nobody who meets us <laughs> thinks that she got a better deal on this marriage. Like that is a given. So yeah, that was a big sales job. Awesome. Tell people where they, uh, where they can connect to you, man. Yeah. Uh, online. Uh, my website's mikeweinberg.com. W-E-I-N. B-E-R-G, MikeWeinberg.com. And on social channels, it's Mike underscore Weinberg on Instagram and on Twitter. And he, he will pop in there. You, you, you ask him a question, Mike is quick to, uh, to I pop try, in. man. I try. I love engaging with people. It's yeah. much more fun than, you know, sitting in an ivory tower. I, I learn about sales every day yeah. and I learn stuff from salespeople. I'm convinced that every client I go to, there's someone who works there that can outsell me. Like I may know more about sales because I study it, I teach it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when I find someone that knows what they're doing, I pick their brain, I steal their best practices. I love watching people do their job. Yeah, I'm always learning. That's why I love so, about so much to learn about. It. Absolutely, so much, man. My, I wish your audience. I wish them huge success and and tons of new sales. Thanks, man. Stay amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. Best to you. All right, man.